Hey everyone, uh, my name is Phil Healy. I'm Public Access Coordinator here at NORCAM. I'm here with uh, Wayne Castingway, and I did get it correct. I, Perfect. I always worry about getting a people's Perfect. names correct. And you are with, who are you with, Wayne? My name is Wayne, as you mentioned. I'm with the Ipswich River Watershed Association, and I'm the Executive Director. And thank you for showing up uh, today and hanging out here and talking. Happy to be here. It's great. Yeah. Well, yeah, and you, I was just talking to you off air about how I, I met your organization. I met Rachel, Rachel Schneider, I believe. Yep. Uh, lovely young woman. Uh, met her at uh, Apple, Fe oh, Apple Fest, which is right across the street. And I'm like, oh, I'd never seen your organization. It mm. sounds great because the Ipswich River runs through town, has everything, you know, it's a lifeblood sure. of this town and a bunch of other towns. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, it's great there's an organization that pretty much uh, is there to set to protect it. Yep. And it, yeah, what can you tell me about uh, the organization? Just real briefly, we've <clears throat> yeah. been around since 1977. As you wow. said, our mission is to protect the Ipswich River. More formally, we're basically a group of people who care about the river, and our mission is um, formally to protect and restore the Ipswich River to health for people and nature. So the dual purpose is really important to us. Yeah. And we came together in the 1970s, a lot of concerns, development, um, a lot of big issues, keeping water clean, um, led to our founding. Oh, that's great. And your background is in, uh, was it uh, marine biology? Yeah, I grew up in the Ipswich River in Ipswich, oh, yeah. um, and first actually in, in West Peabody. Um, my first memory as a kid was fishing with my dad on the Ipswich River that's up great. Boston Street, just downstream from here. And I've been involved with the river my whole life, and I really got interested. And when I graduated high school, I knew I wanted to be involved in nature and the environment, and so I got a degree in fisheries and wildlife and then oh, nice. um, oceanography in graduate school. And it, it brought you back into La Fold as a volunteer, right? Absolutely. Right after college, I started volunteering with the organization, so I've been a volunteer for almost 30 years. Oh, wow. And I was on the board of the directors back in the early 90s, and when our longtime executive director, who really made the organization what it is today, decided to retire a few years ago, they all recruited me, and here I am. Yeah, you're the guy, you're uh, in the thick of it for so long. That's right. And that's usually the best, I find the best course of action if someone is involved so much and they know the ropes and they know, you know, the trials and tribulations and the highs and lows of what it takes to get stuff done. And so what, is, so what specifically can you guys do or what do you like to do? Because I know I was reading the information you, mm -hmm. you and Rachel sent me. You're a mixture of professionals and just straight up volunteers and civilians and uh, some people in... I guess local government, but mm -hmm. what do you, how do you guys get together and... That's a great question. Yeah. We're a very small organization. We only have a small handful of staff. Virtually everything we, done, we do is with partners and volunteers. We're a volunteer-driven organization. We have over 100 volunteers who have formal jobs oh. in, the, in the organization, most of whom test the, the water and, and monitor the water quality, but we have people that can get involved in all levels. Board of Directors to committees. Nice. We have liaisons in each individual community. And so that's basically how we do our work. The small group of staff just leverages this wider community to do our work. And we basically have a few different programs. Our number one job, we like to say, is advocacy, our advocacy program. Uh -huh. So we technically advocate on behalf of the river. Our tagline yeah. is the voice of the river. Oh, and it's really about okay, advocacy. Yeah. So we do everything from working with city officials and city and town officials to improve things for the river. We're very active regionally. Um, and particularly at the state house with, with laws and regulations that protect water quality in the river. We also have a very formal what we call our restoration program. Humans have been mucking around the Ipswich River for about 400 years now. Oh, wow. Well, yeah. much longer than that, but at least Europeans and, and, yeah. and really messing up the river for centuries. And so we're, we're trying to really focus on repairing its health and getting it more resilient so it can be healthier and resilient, particularly in the light of climate change. Oh, okay. Another one of our problems, what we call programs, excuse me, is our community services program. Oh. Another one of our Informal taglines is the cities and towns literally control the fate of the river. The cities yeah. and towns are the entity that re regulate development, and development is the number one risk to the river. And But also the cities and towns through their function are ones that can harm the river through our roadways, putting oh. down road salt in the winter, and our biggest concern is excess of water withdrawals. 
Ipswich River has the dubious distinction of being declared one of the most endangered rivers in America, if you can believe that or no, not. No, yeah, I had Back no in, idea. Back in 2003, oh. and the result of that is there's too much water coming out of the river, being withdrawn, and so the river, during dry periods in the summer, during droughts, can mm. go dry because of that excess withdrawals. The biggest challenge is most of the water that comes out of the river is discharged outside of the watershed, and oh. so we have that perpetual water deficit. So, and I think this, this kind of lays into my next question, because I was reading all the literature you sent me, and I think uh, net zero <coughs> water use, yes. that, that kind of falls into what you're talking about, like not trying to, if new developments or anything else comes in, you have to try to, you hammer home the point that you should apply this net zero water use. Could you go into detail? Yeah, that's that one is? of our, our newest programs. In January of this year, we developed this new policy called net zero. It's, it sounds complicated, but it's pretty simple. Mm. Because of the water withdrawal issue, um, and the fact that after the housing crash in 2008, development mm -hmm. has really returned with a vengeance. Oh, wow. We've been fortunate in the last 10 years, development pressures have been pretty um, minor, yeah. but all that pent up demand, people um, you know, waiting for the economy to improve, improve has really happened and hit us hard the last couple of years. And also the Ipswich River is what the state says is over allocated and legally there's no more water that can be withdrawn so right now we have to stay within the limits that we have today yeah. and so net so um net that's zero true. is all about with new development every gallon that's required to service new development has to come out of that existing allocation yeah. so that basically has to come out of you and i's existing allocation and so we think with that crisis over time there's going to be less and less water in our future available and so we're asking that every city and town join us in developing a net zero policy. And what that simply means is mm. water neutral growth. When new development comes online, we ask for two things. One, that it use water as efficiently as possible. So minimizing outdoor irrigation, efficient fixtures, et cetera, et cetera. But also that those developers offset the amount of new water they're asking for one to one by reducing water use ex elsewhere in the community. So working okay. with the water department for energy efficient rebates, mm. fixing leaks elsewhere in town, renovating inefficient water uses, historic water uses around town so that we can grow yeah. without increasing water use. Well, that's interesting. Has that taken, uh, how, how are people and developers and towns taken that kind of initiative of have, uh, laying it on the developer to try to help kind of level the playing field of if they want to take some, you have to find it and help it the source somewhere else. It's a great question. Danvers has been the community in the watershed um, that's been the leader in this effort, and they have uh, adopted that for years. They have oh, what's nice. called a water mitigation fund, and so they, for every new development, the developers have to pay a fee to save two gallons of water that they um, plan to offset their new water use yeah. around town. And so that fee allows them to do what's often called in other towns a water bank. Okay. And so the town uses that fund to reduce water use elsewhere in town. And so they can grow without increasing demand on the, the river. And that seems simple enough where uh, they don't have to necessarily provide another infrastructure and they can just kind of afford it for the town, like fit the bill. For the town. That's correct. And that's, uh, that's yeah, that seems simple enough. And, and it's, it's, you know, I mean, in a positive sense. That's yeah. right. And it's really not that hard. 50% of the water that comes out of the river in the summertime goes to what we call in our business non essential use. Uh, so that's right. use that we don't need for our everyday life. So things like car washing, watering lawns, mm. things of that nature. So half of the water. So there's a lot of room um, for water conservation. And I think that kind of translates in the summer where, especially in here in North Reading. Uh, there are water bans, or like on opposite days, like you can't, like uh, certain numbers of the street can't use <coughs> water to water their lawn or do whatever. And sometimes it goes, depending on if you don't get enough rain, it, correct me please if I'm wrong, uh, they'll, the drought remains even longer, or the ban rather. Yeah, that, that, that's correct. Um, a lot of people just water their lawns without being aware of how much water that actually needs. Most lawns do not need as much water as people think they do. Yeah. And particularly the type of grass that you plant makes a world of difference. Oh, interesting. Historically, everyone's liked Kentucky bluegrass, which is a non-native grass that yeah. requires a lot of water. That's what most sod is made out of. However, if you just plant your lawn in fescues, 
You can't tell the difference, oh, but okay. fescues are native grasses and they have deep roots, and fescues oh. can stay as green and be as healthy with two thirds less water than bluegrass. So if we were just make that simple shift, yeah. we could save literally millions of gallons of water that's a insane. day. Yeah, it's such a weird vein thing to me. Mm -hmm. But it's, I don't know, that just, I guess it comes from maybe golf course kind of stuff, like Kentucky Blue or whatever. Yeah, it's a really recent cultural phenomenon. Prior to the 1950s, people didn't even like oh. lawns. Oh, yeah. And so it's just a cultural thing. And, yeah. and um, you know, the, the lawn care industry has gotten so huge. The fertilizer companies, they've created this, this, this desire that everyone thinks that we should have green well, lawns all summer long. Well, that, that brings up another question on, on the kind of heels of that. Like, what are the biggest hurdles in that regard? Because do you have, like, uh, people or uh, organizations that represent, like, lawn care interests? Not to get too conspiratory, <laughs> but just, like, weird things where, like, oh, no, no, we want to make sure people mm -hmm. are able to get uh, this grass to do it. Or, like, they're, like, oh, no, any pushback from mm -hmm. uh, these measures you're trying to put forward. Yeah, it's not, we, we like to work cooperatively with people and landscapers, it's an, and we think it's not an either-or proposition. Yeah. It's just how you do it. Oh, and so we have a, what's called a Greenscapes program where we actually partner with municipalities. We're proud to say that oh, cool. North Reading is an active member of our Greenscapes Coalition. All right. And we basically, and it's all about education and awareness. Um, people just may not be aware that if you simply planted fescue, um, you could save two-thirds amount of water or plant a slightly smaller lawn. And so we're actively working with citizens in the communities just to educate and increase awareness to make this, it's a cultural shift. Yeah. And, um, you know, we think the, the future's bright. Um, and so you can yeah. have your cake and eat it too. No, and that's a very good question. I mean, a very good response, a good answer to that. Because being combative, I think, fi I find it leads to more, like, people digging themselves in a hole. Absolutely. And I, it, being cooperative seems to be the best way to go. And it, it's very funny because you can also attack the problem. Uh, it seems like you are de facto uh, fiscally. You know, fiscally, you can attack the problem like, oh, yeah, you don't need to water as much with this type of grass. Right. So you're saving on your water bill and just any and also your time and maintenance of lawns. Because, like, I don't know, I, during a hot summer day, do you really want to spend all day like in the, like mowing and uh, right, watering your right. lawn? So, I mean. Yeah, the more you water yeah. it, the more you have to mow it. And actually, yeah. heavily, grasses have evolved to go dormant in the summertime. Oh, really? All grasses are what's called cool weather plants. Yeah. And so they're adapted to be green in the spring and fall, but not in the summer. Uh -huh. And by keeping them green and growing all summer, it's actually unhealthy for the grass. Uh -huh. And so allowing them to go dormant is their natural growth um, system and they're actually healthier, and so it's cheaper and easier ah. to, to change how we care for our lawns. Oh, no, it's, it's, it's the, kind of like the same thing where a forest fire needs to happen to get rid of the brush and mm -hmm. kind of rise anew. Exactly. Oh, wow, that's kind of great. Yeah. Uh, no, very informative, and this is why we love bringing people in to talk <laughs> yep, about this absolutely. sort of thing. So on the subject of North Reading and, and uh, North Reading being a great partner mm -hmm. uh, with you and your organization, like what other, uh, looking at the notes you, uh, I have right here, uh, so North Reading, it, it gets its water from Ipswich that's correct. River, right? Yep, so, from, yeah. from the groundwater. Um, one thing we try to educate folks on is all water is connected. Yeah. Um, the river, um, a lot of people think it flows due to rainfall, but it only rains every once a week, every in the summertime, once a month maybe. Yeah. Um, but what keeps a river flowing is the groundwater. Yeah. And so the groundwater, or what we call the aquifer, is intimately connected to every stream, river, and pond. And the level of the river, the level of our ponds, is exactly the same level of its adjacent aquifer. And so North Reading, like most communities in the Ipswich, withdraws their water from that aquifer yeah. adjacent to the river. Mm. And those aquifers are directly connected. So literally, when you pump those aquifers, you're taking the water directly from the river, even though it's through the aquifer. Mm. And so there's a direct connection. And so particularly when it's dry, um, and we, we have a, a dry spell, um, we really hope that the communities will, and individuals who have private wells, because all water is connected underground, mm -hmm. will withdraw less and conserve water. No, that, no, that's great. And it's good to know where your water comes from. Absolutely. Yeah. North Reading is one of 14 communities that gets their water from the river every day. 350,000 people and businesses drink from the river every day. So oh, wow. protecting that is, is our most important duty. Yeah, and uh, back to, uh, of course, yeah, you have to. And not just for the natural beauty of it or, or the natural order of that, 
uh, of a river. Uh, but just like you said, just for the, the practical reasons that we all need to drink and, and cook and clean mm -hmm. uh, with it. So, and going back to when you were talking about um, cleaning up the rivers and taking care of man-made uh, obstacles, yep. so like uh, what, what are we talking about there um, as far as like inter man-made intervention with the river flow? Like how do you guys... Yeah, so in terms of the problems, we already talked about our number one problem, the water imbalance. There's yeah. too much water coming out and it's going back naturally. But another one of our big challenges is what's called storm water. Oh, okay. uh, storm water is rainfall that runs off of developed land and in, invariably due to the way we live, there's a lot of pollution on the development. Mm. You know, oil from car drippings, fertilizers on our lawns, mm. droppings from our pets. Um, all of that is washed into the river every time it rains, what's called storm water. Storm water is the number one source of water pollution in America. Oh. And so our job is really working to reduce the amount of storm water pollution and again, we work with cities and towns to educate people on doing that. So that's how we manage our land, hmm. and that's the way to prevent that pollution from actually getting into the river. The other big thing that's really a, an issue of concern uh, more recently is what we call in our business barriers. Oh, okay. And barriers are any man-made structure that intercepts flow. So roads and bridges okay. or culverts, big barriers in, in rivers are dams, like the Bostick Dam at the uh, Middleton, North oh, okay. Reading Town Line. And those things really disrupt the ecology of the river. They actually increase flooding upstream of those structures because they're a restriction. Yeah. And we're working very intimately with the cities and towns to remove some of those barriers. And you asked earlier about what's going on in North Reading. Yeah, yeah. We're actively working with Bostick just downstream to remove the Bostick's dam, um, which will really change the, the whole river to the benefit of the community of North Reading. Right now it's a barrier to paddling and and using the river because it's all private property. Oh, okay. Once that dam comes out, it'll really open up opportunities for recreation in North Reading. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you uh, for being a part of that. Now, what yeah. is, just for my, uh, my own edification, I guess for everyone else too, but what's a culvert? So a culvert is basically where a roadway goes over a wetland or a stream. Okay. And so the culvert is the man-made um, structure that oh. the, the river goes from up upstream of the road to downstream. So that how's to conveys the water under a road. Oh, and see. North Reading, um, there are almost 100 culverts. <laughs> well, I think um, there's one literally right down the road by, uh, I think by Mike's and all that, where it's just kind of like, it's almost like, that's not, right. not, yeah, not like a bridge, but just kind of like right. a structure in between. So it's the basically river. a type of bridge, but it's yeah. pipe instead of a bridge. Ah, fair enough. And that, uh, so how, oh wow, that's, yeah, look, they're everywhere. That's right, yeah. they are everywhere. Big, big problem. Not yeah. only do they cause flooding, they're really, damaging to aquatic life both things that live in the water like turtles and fish mm. but also for terrestrial wildlife because almost all wildlife move along streams yeah. and when do this test next time anytime right. you see a dead animal on the road 90 percent of the time you look over it's near a culvert it's actually very interesting yeah i i now that i look back on <laughs> my cache of memory <laughs> it's like oh yeah just right beside that yeah, cool. so what we're doing well, is work with that. dpw's um, departments of Public Works to upgrade those culverts to make them bigger. Oh, I see. And then the animals and the fish can get through across the road without harm instead of having to go up over the road. And the, or if you're a fish, you can swim right through. Yeah, and not necessarily eliminating all, but just making a better version that's of it. That's correct. Yeah. Oh, wow, that's great. That's right. So yeah, it, just as far as another uh, couple of questions, what uh, you mentioned a couple of projects in North Reading. Um, any other ones you're working on right now? Yeah, or? a couple of um, exciting projects. Yeah. Um, one thing we're really excited about is Martin's Pond. Oh, it is okay. a great resource in, in North Reading. Yeah. It's in fact the biggest pond in the whole watershed. Oh, cool. um, and we are actively bringing back what's called anadromous fish or um, specifically river herring. These are fish that spend their lives in the ocean yeah. but they reproduce in fresh water. Oh. Historically Martin's Pond, believe it or not, was the number one spawning pond for river herring in the entire watershed. Literally a million fish used to come into Martin's Pond every year wow. from the ocean. And they've been blocked for three centuries now because of the Bostick Dam, which is one of the oldest dams actually in Massachusetts. Oh my God. No. Wow, that's insane. And so right now um, we hope to begin stocking that pond next year. Yeah. And the Bostick Dam is due to come out next year. And what will happen is those fish that are reproduced that will imprint on Martin's Pond, 
they'll go to sea for four years yeah. and then they'll come back to their natal habitat to reproduce and it'll be a game changer in terms of the ecology of Martin's Pond. Yeah. Anadromous fish, specifically river herring, actually take nutrients out of the water. They absorb nutrients and bring them up back to the ocean with them. Yeah. And as a result, that'll clean up Martin's Pond. Martin's Pond has suffered from a cyanobacteria bloom for years, yeah. preventing swimming. And these fish, returning the pond to its natural state, huh. can actually help improve water quality dramatically and may actually prevent those blooms in the future. Yeah, no, it seems insane. Because uh, I, I received calls when I was living here mm -hmm. and been to many meetings where the an, uh, agenda item would be like, oh, invasive species in Martin's Pond. And the yeah. Martin Pond Association would have to come and ask for, and here's another thing, uh, you're, with this, you're actually uh, fiscally, you're uh, taking care of another problem that you don't have to spend uh, X amount of money on. Exactly. Basically, yeah. if you restore the health of these aquatic systems, um, it improves the health, but also can save money, yeah. helps with recreation. Yeah, no, and that's, yeah, people can go back to, like you said, swimming and. It's, it's a win win. Yeah. yeah. The other project we're working on all up and down the watershed, but specifically in North Reading as well, it's called what's called the Ipswich River Water Trail. Okay. The Ipswich River is the number one paddling destination on the entire North Shore of Massachusetts. Um, and right now there are 21 public canoe and kayak landings up and down the river. We're actively working with every city and town as well as the state to upgrade all those facilities and put in informational kiosks and maps at every put-in. Within a matter of weeks, we're putting in a new kiosk and map at the North Reading landing mm -hmm. at the Ipswich River Park mm -hmm. and so we're really excited to work with North Reading and just really make that put in um, a much more accessible place for people to paddle and when the Bostick Dam comes out you can literally put in here at Ipswich River Park and paddle to the ocean and, oh, and back wow. uh, so that's something we're really actively working on this year. That's crazy and uh, what's the time frame for that do you think? Um... Um, we're, we hope to be done by by the, the fall, so we're actively working with that now. As oh, I mentioned, the kiosk will go up in a matter of a couple of weeks wow. and be done by, by this winter. No, that's that's wonderful. That's pretty good timing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so no, can, oh, that's amazing. Wow, all right. Uh, that's great. That's all great news to hear, and uh, your organization is doing uh, some great stuff. <clears throat> and we're, we're more than happy to hear about it, and we appreciate you coming by. Is there any, is there a website uh, or contact info you'd like to uh, throw out uh, the crowd. That yep, real easy to remember, ipswichriver.org, one word, yep. and you can go to that site and learn about the organization, all these issues. What we'd love to put a call out is for volunteers and for people to get involved. Mm -hmm. We're a group of volunteers, primarily volunteer-driven, so people get involved by volunteering, helping. We have a lot of programs and events, education programs, paddling events, and other events. People can join the organization through coming to one of those great events. And we're also a membership organization. We rely on membership for 100% of our support. Yeah. So we hope everyone in North Reading will become a member. It's, it's a great deal, yeah. $40 for individuals, $50 for a whole year. We also have a fleet of canoes and kayaks available for free oh, for members at any time. Oh, that's awesome. So there's a great benefit. and we You don't just, have to own a canoe. That's correct. Yeah. It's a lot easier. <laughs> yeah, really so we really encourage everyone to get involved that way. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, Wayne, thank you for coming by. And uh, anything else you'd like to, to say? Or We talked a lot, and I think we got a lot across. But No, I just want to thank you and North Reading oh, um, for taking care of the river. And again, get, get involved. Yeah, get involved. So uh, check out that website. And uh, Wayne, thank you again for coming. You're welcome. Thanks for the opportunity. No worries. And uh, take it easy. And yeah, go to that website and learn more about uh, your surroundings. And go ahead and help out. Mm -hmm.